and welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group bi-weekly meeting. It is January 19th, 2017. If you missed our meeting last time, let me say happy, to, happy New Year to you this time. Um, we're well into 2017 now, which is already a little crazy for me and likely for most of you. So let's jump into our meeting. we got some exciting stuff to talk about today. So the uh, special interest groups are part of the larger SharePoint Patterns and Practices program, which is now under SharePoint Engineering. And what are we all about? So we're mainly about two things, which is open discussion and learning around the SharePoint framework, uh, which is now at release candidate zero, which is really exciting. Um, love to see that out there. Uh, folks are doing some really cool stuff with that. We're getting some great feedback around that. Uh, Vase is going to talk about the latest with that here shortly. And we're also here to talk about building these JavaScript core components. We'll talk a little bit about the evolution of that on today's call. Um, some exciting news there, as well as some news around uh, provisioning with the JavaScript stuff. So I want to talk through that, talk through the core team's thoughts about that, and then uh, sort of how that's going to relate to the community and what that, uh, in my mind, looks like moving forward, and then sort of uh, open up the floor to, for discussions around that. <clears throat> So two links down at the bottom, the AKMS SP PNP community will get you uh, out to the uh, Microsoft Tech community, which is great for, uh, you know, if you have questions or looking for resources, things like that. And then dev.office.com slash SharePoint is your landing page for all SharePoint development. So whether you want to learn the new SharePoint framework stuff, whether you have add-in development questions, whether you have classic server-side SharePoint development questions, um, that is your one-stop shop. And there's links and pages to all the various bits of documentation and areas there. So that's a great uh, starting point uh, for everything SharePoint development. So definitely check that out if you have not. So looking at our agenda for today, uh, like I said, updates on the latest for SharePoint Framework. Release Candidate Zero is out, which is really exciting. It's really close uh, to what's going to be final, or at least the shape of what's going to be final. Uh, we're going to talk through some of those core component stuff that's coming up. I'm going to sort of demo and show off some of the things with uh, 2.0 that's coming, and then also want to talk through the provisioning uh, updates. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have some time for open discussion and questions as we have in the past as well. So moving into the SharePoint framework, uh, Vason, you want to take over? Yes, let me do that, and let me unmute myself so I'm not talking to myself uh, in the office room. So. Uh, there we go. Now I'm actually stealing the presentation. So uh, a few um, updates on this one. So the release candidate, let's actually start going on through the slides. Uh, so the release candidate went out last week. Uh, so uh, and the release candidate, like mentioned in the previous uh, special interest group call, there were some breaking chances. Uh, what we wanted to do with release candidate is rather to have those breaking chances as part of the release candidate uh, rather than when we go to GA. Uh, we are actually getting pretty close to the general availability. So if you haven't had a time uh, to have a look on the SharePoint framework and you've been kind of awaiting whenever it's ready to be used in production, we're actually not that far away. Um, so uh, we're not talking about months and months and months, uh, much less than that. So the release candidate is already pretty close on what we're going to ship uh, as a GA. There's certain adjustments here, uh, here and there which we're still uh, doing, uh, like easier way of deploying uh, web, uh, web parts to be available within sites. Uh, we've been adjusting some of the, the areas after the release candidate in production as well. We did have a, as an example, we did have a, some issues related on using SharePoint framework uh, client-side web parts in classic pages and last week and earlier this week, and that has been now tackled in production. So if we were testing a release candidate in SharePoint Online, in first list tenants or a dev tenant, um, you were able to use them only within the modern pages, not within the classic pages, and that has been now resolved. Uh, so I think we fixed that yesterday uh, in the production. Um, but in general, the API layers and API level uh, and APIs are super, super close already uh, with the GA. So we're more we're working now on the infrastructural side, making sure that that's uh, fully functional. Uh, what else on the SharePoint framework side? Um, so uh, we were looking into, obviously, there's some new guidance again uh, since past two weeks uh, already in the devtelops.com slash SharePoint. And by the way, please do remember, if you're a SharePoint developer, you should no longer go to the MSDN. Uh, we are actually, we will gradually, uh, let's say, 
I wouldn't say deprecate, we will shut down MSDN gradually during the spring and we'll move the documentation to a new location. But uh, while we are on this journey, uh, the devtodocs.com slash SharePoint is the right location for all of the latest uh, SharePoint development topics. So SharePoint Framework, Webhooks uh, is in here, uh, SharePoint Framework reference APIs are actually in the devtodocs.com slash SharePoint. We're moving in the SharePoint adding model documentation here as well, which is slightly off the topic of today, but still. Uh, and we're looking into moving the REST API documentation there as well. Um, and there will be then further announcements in, uh, for the future of the MSDN. The, the existing MSDN, as an example, uh, just kind of clarify that statement. The existing MSDN is super, 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 super old technology, uh, and it requires uh, people uh, at the level of COBOL to maintain that information. So we're looking into taking advantage of a more modern publishing mechanisms in the future so that the community can also contribute and if there's any issues they can actually fix that or they can submit an issue in, a, in a pull requests in a GitHub and all of that is getting reflected uh, in the in the UIs as well. Um, Soon to be released uh, documentation, these are not quite yet uh, out there in the table of content. Uh, localizing, uh, localization or localizing client-side web ports. This is a topic which we did a webcast together with Waldeck, uh, which went live on this Monday in our video section in YouTube, but there's an actual tutorial is going to be released on that one. Uh, we're going to release a enterprise guidance documentation for SharePoint Framework, so thinking about what is actually SharePoint Framework, why is it beneficial, kind of a more as a enterprise architect level discussion, what is a SharePoint Framework. And then a SharePoint Framework team development document is, is also pretty far uh, in the queue of getting out as well. So all of these are pretty soon going to be available in the devtodocs.com slash SharePoint, uh, such as SPFX and, and so on. Um, we also released, as part of the release candidate, we moved uh, our existing reference API documentation to devtodops.com uh, slash SharePoint as well. Uh, a short link for that one is aka MS SPFX reference, and you'll land on that page uh, where we have all of the documentation, API documentation for SharePoint framework. So this will help whenever you start deep diving on the SharePoint framework and starting to figure out what are the options within the base classes in the TypeScript and, and what are the methods and all of that. Um, and all of this information is coming also from GitHub, uh, so we're able to update that uh, quite seamlessly uh, as we move along, which is really good. Um, and kind of at general points and general points on the on the latest de uh, development on, on SharePoint framework, some of this I actually already mentioned, but tutorials and labs uh, are already updated at the release candidate level. So if you go to the devtodops.com slash SharePoint uh, and getting started with, with web part or uh, let's say setting up your development box, uh, all of that is already in the release candidate level. Uh, the videos uh, are going to be updated tomorrow in YouTube. So so we do have a recorded videos of those tutorials as well. So if you prefer, rather than reading, you want to see me explaining what's actually happening and how to get started, how to create your first client-side web port, those videos currently, today, are still in the August level. So they're in a drop one level, so they're pretty far actually behind. But there's going to be updated tomorrow in YouTube, which is a good thing. Uh, and from the devtodops.com slash SharePoint, uh, in those tutorial pages, there's a link to the videos as well. So all of that is, is taken care of. Um, and by the way, I, I want an additional video kind of related on this one. So I did do a recording earlier today uh, on setting up your development environment uh, because quite often, especially for classic SharePoint developers, we seem to get the feedback that, hey, it's super, super complex. I need to install Node.js, NPM, uh, Gulp, and all of this stuff. Uh, I don't know how to do that, even though it's actually documented in our, our uh, documents. Uh, there's a video available on that one starting tomorrow as well. Um, and for a clean machine, uh, Windows 10 machine, I think it took me like 10 minutes uh, to get the environments uh, up and running. So it's a super fast thing as well. So we kind of reduced the reduced the time to set up uh, SharePoint framework uh, environments quite significantly comparing what was the situation with the drop to uh, one back in the August timeframe. Um, 
what else? Uh, sample updates ongoing. So some of the sample updates are already in the release candidate level. Uh, we're looking into getting them to the release candidate level first and then to the GA level whenever we get to the GA. And this is going to happen on, the, on this week and following week as well. Uh, getting started with SharePoint Framework training packets, we talked about this one uh, a few times in the special interest group call. Uh, we went through the agenda and everything else. Uh, this was actually waiting the release candidate to go live so that we're able to verify our uh, hands-on labs and verify our presentations and everything else. And this is actually now uh, the labs has been already updated to the release candidate level, uh, and now we are doing internal reviews and making sure that everything is working properly uh, with the latest builds. Whenever that's fine, uh, we cannot release the additional labs, additional presentations, uh, and pretty soon after that also videos explaining specific topics around the SharePoint framework, so additional videos for people to consume as well. Uh, new articles, I kind of mentioned this one already, so localizing SharePoint Framework web parts, uh, enterprise guidance team development coming up quite soon, uh, actually most likely tomorrow or early next week. And then there are a few more samples uh, in the SharePoint GitHub organization related on client-side web parts. Um, and that is, by the way, a great, great, great resource to understand how would I do X and Y and Z uh, using React or Angular or Knockout. And there are simplistic samples, there are complex samples as well. So it's a really, really, really superb resource. Um, and the easiest way to actually find all of these samples, uh, one URL to remember again, AKMS SBFX samples, you land actually in the dev.office.com uh, slash uh, the, the PMP catalog, sample catalog, and from there you're able to then have a look on are you interested on React components or Angular or Knockout, and you can see all of the samples which are available. So super useful resource for you to consume as well. Now. Kind of, since we are closing into the GA, um, and uh, I didn't want to actually do a demo on the, hey, this is the release candidate, because technically there is a, really isn't, there's certain changes in API level, but they're not really significant uh, from a, ooh, that's super cool perspective. Um, it's more around, hey, don't use that API, use this API. But I wanted to quickly have a chat before we move forward on Patrick's area, or more on the PMPJS core, is that Whenever we get the samples updated, we have the tutorials updated, we have the videos updated, we have the, the additional documentation. What's needed? What's actually missing? So let's let's assume that we are GA uh, available right now today. If we have existing guidance, documentations, and samples on the same level, what's missing? from your perspective as a community member to get started on, on implementing uh, client-side records, except time, obviously, to learn to do that. But is there something, guidance, samples, documentation, which is in top of your mind, kind of a, and we need to have X and Y and Z, otherwise I can't do that. And feel free to use the iron window or even go unmute or unmute yourself um, to tell us what would be missing, or are we actually in a situation that, hey, we're good to go, which is great. So any feedback? Differences between SPFX and Webpack. Well, Webpack is actually used by SPFX, so it's a, it's a tooling inside uh, which, which we're using, so it's, it's not really uh, there's no, as such, a difference. Um, provisioning web parts uh, onto a page, uh, and that's a good comment from Lee, um, so, or Dale, it's probably Dale. Um, so that's more on the modern, uh, modern site customer, modern site customization, uh, and also how do we get this on the page of the of the classic sites, and that's absolutely something what we're looking. It's not precisely on the deliverables of SharePoint Framework, because actually modern uh, sites and lists and libraries and pages is not part of the SharePoint Framework. SharePoint Framework is the underlying development environment for client-side web parts as a step one, and then for numerous other things in the future. So client-side web parts is only one step and one component in the, in the SharePoint Framework. Uh, 
Uh, Ruben is saying how to provision and manage ALM. ALM is a good topic, absolutely. We need to get that one uh, more clarified. That's understandable. So how does the, the tooling and everything else, uh, how do we get the source control and automate tested and all of that uh, clarified? That's absolutely understandable. Um, so Nigel is saying uh, what I can do with SPFX that I cannot do with Webpack. What can, what can I do uh, in the cloud that I cannot do in on-premises? Okay, th so let's clarify that slightly. So Webpack is essentially tooling what SharePoint Framework uh, is, is using. It's an automation tooling in the, uh, or a task tooling, um, and we use that heavily as well. SharePoint Framework is providing us APIs, base, baseline classes for TypeScript, uh, which are then integrating to the SharePoint. Um, and SharePoint Framework does use Webpack uh, in, the, in the tooling as well. So you can technically, if you, if you don't want to use the client-side web part framework, it means that you don't have a property pane, you're not actually creating a web part, it's as such, you would be just creating a, a script with a web part. So you could actually write your stuff without a SharePoint framework as well. Then it wouldn't be a SharePoint framework client-side web part, uh, web part uh, but you could use Webpack uh, as the tooling uh, uh, for automating certain tasks there as well. But it's not really, they're, they're dependent on each other, um, but it's not really a competition. Um, Webpack handles the bundling, uh, indeed. Uh, so how do we actually uh, package the, the JavaScript uh, to a single, all of the, these individual JavaScript files to a single JavaScript file, or which of them we actually package? And ACS is clarifying that as well. Uh, we need docs on how to import external types. Uh, yes, that's actually a good point. We probably should clarify that. Uh, for some people, that might be super clear. Uh, for some people, uh, that might not be super clear. So if you have a look on the up updated tutorials on the jQuery UI implementation, that's where we, for example, uh, npm install types and jQuery and jQuery UI to the client-side web part. So, it's nothing more than actually installing those types uh, into the uh, solution. So, but if there's any specifics and if we need any, any additional clarifications on that, absolutely, let's get that one clarified. The way to exclude external libraries from being bundled is not very easy to find unless you find that in other guides provided. Good feedback. Uh, we probably should be more specific on that one because that, that's a super, super important thing to understand. When do you reference a React or Angular or whatever JavaScript uh, from a CDN? Because you don't want to bundle those in uh, the, the same JavaScript because otherwise the bundle size would get super, super big. Um, Uh, docs to import MBA declaration. Why would you guys have that? That's a TypeScript thing. Why that uh, do docs? So, and fair point. Um, so, good point on the. So, we're trying to kind of walk on the line of what does the SharePoint classic SharePoint developer mean uh, need as starting point, and obviously we want to more concentrate on referencing those things which already exist. We don't want to be the guys who are responsible of maintaining some of these uh, documents which are actually more related on TypeScript or let's say Webpack or whatever. Um, but it's a, it's a really difficult line to actually dance um, because obviously we could just pinpoint, hey, have a look on from there. If you come from a background where you don't have a web stack, uh, a previous knowledge on a web stack, um, that might feel an oversight. It might feel that, hey, Microsoft, you're not giving me the tools how to do my job on the SharePoint framework. And that's why we actually want to reference some of the stuff uh, and help people to actually get started on some of this stuff in our guidance as well. But again, we don't want to du duplicate documents. That's, that's a fair comment. Um, recommendation about use PMPJS core uh, with SharePoint framework. Well, it's an option. Uh, we, uh, this, 
this is a classic discussion, and I can go on and on for that one for hours. There's no such things as best practices or recommendations. It really depends on what are you trying to achieve, and what is the skill set of your team, what is the skill set of yourself, and uh, to choose the right tool for you. One man's best practice could be a horrible mistake for another man, and that's why we don't actually explicitly say recommendations, uh, black and white recommendations or best practices anymore, because quite often there are, those are wrong. Uh, personally, I never participate on any seminar sessions which are best practices with whatever, because you can't define best practices. It depends on the, on the context of what they're trying to achieve. Um, Joel has a good point on the, on the bundling, uh, which is really the key point. People forgetting about the exclude libraries and then the page sizes grow uh, enormously, uh, which is one thing which we need to be super clear. So um, clarify the bundling uh, model and what does it actually mean. And obviously reference external documentation on that, so coming back on AC's comment on that. Um, a typical web part to CRUD items from a list, for example, from a Rupin. Uh, we do have a sample on that one. Uh, we do have a sample which is showing how to do CRUD operations using uh, PMP JSCore, React, Angular, and uh, jQuery, and without any framework. So we do have an existing sample. Maybe we should have then a tutorial or an article pinpointing those differences. The, the sample itself is actually, there's a good readme file on the sample as well. But maybe the problem is more on people finding those samples, uh, which we need to work on, which is actually one of the things in general what we're working on, but that will still take some time, uh, is, the, is the better and more compelling assemble catalog or an assemble portal site, a CMS site, where people can find what's relevant for them. Um, just going to write something down. Could, um, could, um, the entire open source community seems to be moving to server rendering and making pages fast and mobile friendly with BWA, and we are providing framework where we are telling users to use whatever library they want, where they could have 10 plus different frameworks loading without server rendering. Are we imp uh, working on improving the story? Um, now, I would say that we're working improving the story in the, that sense that uh, pretty soon you can absolutely call uh, uh, your external services to handle server-side operations and combine with the client-side SPFX, client-side web parts, a server-side piece without any additional authentication, and we get all of that clarified. Um, we are absolutely aware of the challenge of, of uh, the fact that if we have 10 different web parts, and all of the 10 different web parts are loading 10 different libraries, then the page sizes are enormous. Um, it's absolutely true. Uh, moving the stuff from the server side is viable solution, uh, certain things to the server side, which, by the way, is one of the reasons, uh, as an example, why the, the provisioning logic was taken away from the PMP JS core, because technically it does not make any sense in any scenario to do site provisioning using JavaScript, unless it is actually done on a server side. But doing that in a client side is not really an enterprise ready solution. Um, so, and that's now taken to another library, and that's going to be released as a separate package, and uh, you can use that within the Node.js as well. And if you prefer uh, using a C-sharp backend, absolutely doable as well, and then you're able to use the BMP provisioning engine over there as an example. Um, Joel uh, is saying, some months ago I implemented SP provider hosted app uh, on prem for client using Node app, although it was really hard to find documentation and authentication. Is there something on the pipeline for this that we can know of? Um, that's actually a good point. Uh, maybe we should provide some connectivity between uh, that one and having a SharePoint provider hosted adding samples on a Node.js as well. In general, in the app model, uh, we will have investments, uh, engineering investments on the app model as well. So we're looking making the actual add-ins uh, responsive as well, so even though they're using iframe, they would be responsive, um, and that you're able to use the, the SharePoint framework inside of the add-in as well. But the add-in is giving you the security isolation, because that's 
being asked by many customers as well. And those investments will happen most likely during this spring. Uh, it really depends on our internal priorities and, and schedules. Um, but kind of related on adding model. But I think what Joel is more referring is, is making, having Node.js samples using SharePoint, or implemented as SharePoint adding, which does make sense as well. Uh, I thought Microsoft was, Microsoft was telling developers to get their code off the SharePoint servers as if the code crashes, it can take out the whole farm, whereas use the client code, it can only take out the client. Absolutely true. So we are telling that do not put your custom code on the SharePoint server. Now, it might be a server next to SharePoint server, which is the classic provider hosted adding model. Um, in on-premises, it might be an IIS server or Node.js uh, box, uh, which is serving that. And from a SharePoint perspective, it's a client. The client is hosted, though, uh, outside of SharePoint, and it's using the remote APIs to call in to the SharePoint and doing operations. So we absolutely want to go away from the fact that we're using farm solutions, because those are problematic to maintain, they have multiple challenges, everything else. In certain scenarios, once again, this is not a black and, black and white statement. In certain scenarios, absolutely, uh, it might be the best option or only option if you are in on-premises. In SharePoint Online, no. Maybe in on-premises, you want to align more on the SharePoint on uh, the client-side development as well. Whenever we ship SharePoint framework, the SharePoint 2016, you can actually have a one implementation uh, again, which will work in on-premises and in cloud, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think, well, Bill is having an awesome comment. I think it's up to the developer to decide what framework to use, and the developer is responsible to be aware of the consequences. And this really actually comes down on, on uh, the fact that, um, personally as well, I, we never actually tell what is the best practice. Because immediately if Microsoft or Microsoft would go and say, hey, it's the best practice to use React or Angular or BMP JS Core or BMP Provisioning Engine or SharePoint Framework or um, whatever, people would actually um, take that as the, hey, those are saying that it's the best practice. I don't know why, but it's the best practice. Um, and they wouldn't actually think about the differences. Um, we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to make sure that people make a knowingly decision to do a, go to a certain direction with the advantages and disadvantages, knowing those advantages and disadvantages on their decision as well. A uh, developer can choose, they cannot know about the consequences too, uh, because they aren't once putting the stuff on a page. Well, the fair point for Mike, well, we need to get the consequences documented. Uh, as an example, document what does it, why do we, we, why did we use, React? well, we use React in Microsoft in, in our in engineering, what is the impact of not using React, well, there's an additional JavaScript uh, library then loaded on a page, is that a massive deal? No, it isn't, um, but thinking through the bundling impact and all of that uh, impact. I think it's, it's more on the education. Um, and making sure that we, as a Microsoft, we document uh, why and the impact of certain actions. That's really the key point. And I think Mike, I think actually Mike and Bill uh, are talking about the, almost the same thing. Most likely Bill will agree on that. So if the, if the developer is unaware uh, how the bundling actually works, as an example, and we don't educate the, the field enough on the bundling, uh, they can actually cause um, significant challenges from a performance perspective. And we as Microsoft, we absolutely want to have the sufficient amount of uh, documentation on that. And Mike, do you want to say something as well? Yeah, I was just going to say, the so the developer doesn't know um, what other frameworks are going to be running on the page their web part gets added to. Sure. Um, and the developers don't know the consequences either because oh. they don't know, they didn't develop all of the parts on that page, right? I mean, it could have been from seven different developers. Yep. No. Okay, Mike, yeah, but I think if you choose to use some wild framework that nobody else is using, I think you, you should know that that's the likely consequence is that your web part on the page will slow the page down because you're adding another uh, library into the page. Uh, that's what I, I, th I think we're kind of splitting well, hairs a little bit. But, so. No, what I'm saying is like um, 
So I get uh, I install a part on the page, right? And that one is running the latest version of Angular 2, right? Then I have one that's running React. Then I have one that's running two versions old of React. Then I have one running two versions old of Angular 2. Right? It's you. It's we're basically like saying put everything into the page and send it to the client. Um, yeah, I mean that's true of any web page, isn't it? No. No, most web pages, you know exactly what's on there because you put it all together. Yeah, but most most developers are pulling in different um, different uh, components from various sources. I mean, I, I think I think we're splitting hairs a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm I, I think you're both actually agreeing on the on the core thing, and I, I and it's it's just yes, there could be a situation where the developer could cause challenges, and yes, we need to educate the developers as well. Um, in the end, uh, obviously, the service itself cannot make the decision that hey, your web part is, is loading insane library. Let's ignore that. Um, that won't happen. So. Yeah, and it's just the same as if somebody develops a web part and it's very inefficient for some reason. You know, that's also going to so that's that's a consequence of choosing a, a, a not having the, the 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 same version of the libraries that everybody else is using. But I I, I take Mike's point. Out that, yeah, there's there's yeah. Uh, there's a, a valid case there as well. And like AC is saying, this isn't really a new problem. Uh, it's a classic challenge on the, on the web development. Um, going back on the Iron Window, there's a few questions. Uh, and, and I think we need to move on the, the, the presentation quite soon. But there's certain questions. And, and absolutely fine to have the Q&A uh, at this point as well. But we slightly got off track on the guidance samples and documentation, what's actually needed. But I'm going to address this uh, quickly. So AC is asking around any update on the policy for uh, update cadence. Um, so how do we, uh, what is the, the provider hosted versions of React and, and other libraries? No updates at this point for those. Uh, we're still uh, fixing stuff um, in the RC and getting the, and, and hopefully we will have that one ready for GA. That's absolutely the intention. Now, I cannot promise that on behalf of certain persons, uh, but looking into, uh, looking into, we're absolutely aware of the issue and we need to get that one and document that. Um, AC is also commenting release candidate zero implies uh, won't be the last, but I've heard GA is coming very soon. Can I expect more release candidates uh, prior to GA? Good question. Um, we, we've been internally using uh, terms release candidate zero or release candidate. Uh, most likely this will be the only release candidate and will hit into the GA after that. Now, theoretically, we might still change our stance. Uh, so, but um, we are looking into heading to the GA relatively soon. So it might be that release candidate zero is the only release candidate what goes actually live as a release candidate. And um, blah, 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 blah. cool. Can we have an architecture? Uh, now we're on the on back on the documentation. Can we have an architecture document showing all the components required servers for COP and ETC? Yes, we can. Uh, absolutely, good input on that. Um, now. Let's switch to the gears to move on to the presentation side, and we can continue the Q&A uh, after Patrick's uh, presentation as well. So, Patrick, uh, will you take over your stuff? Yep. So, taking yes. over presentation here. So, everybody should see the PSP PNP JS Core component slide. Nothing's really changed on that yep, slide. Yep. All good. Um, so as always, thank you to all our contributors. Try and say that every week, um, and uh, really appreciate. We've gotten not necessarily contributions, but a lot of great feedback on uh, the 2.0 uh, code that's in the dev branch still. So really appreciate that from everybody that's pointed out some bugs or had some suggestions on improvements. So that's uh, super valuable. Um, want to mention as always opportunities to to participate um, demo a SharePoint framework web part on this call um, you can demo anything related to the uh, the JS core library on this call um, you can contribute on github and you can provide feedback uh, of course those are also welcome but um, I do want to stress again we're definitely looking for folks to do some demos so if you're doing something cool with release candidate zero or something cool with the uh, you know JS core on node or something like that um, would love to get folks from the community an opportunity to demo their work 
um, here on this call. So if you're excited uh, about the work you've been doing and want to show it off, please just let myself or Vesa know, and uh, we'd love to get you a spot on the this biweekly call to kind of show that off and get you some exposure for uh, the cool cool stuff you're doing um, and get the community an opportunity to learn uh, from everybody else in the community. So some quick updates. Um, 2.0, we're likely going to push that Friday or Monday. That's now dependent on uh, me getting the blog post written. And so that's going to include a bunch of great bug fixes, some new features, um, and it incorporates a lot of the great feedback. Again, thank you to the community for that feedback. Uh, it really makes uh, everything uh, grow and be stronger through that feedback. And then uh, the updated wiki is going to be uh, part of that 2.0 release. So we talked about that a little bit on the last call, and uh, we're going to talk about that a tiny bit more on this call. And I also am t going to touch uh, on the provisioning. So we've got the code out to the new repo for provisioning. Um, and want to stress again, that's really going to right now be a community-driven project. Um, so if folks from the community have interest and a passion around uh, provisioning, um, that's where we want to see you get involved and contribute to that provisioning library. Um, the thing is, uh, we just don't have the personnel right now to, on our side, commit to doing that. Um, and also, we sort of are invested in the client side or the uh, the CSOM, uh tool chain, so the managed code um, community. Or I'm sorry, the managed code provisioning uh, stuff, which is fairly mature at this point. Um, and so that's kind of where a lot of our energy is. But if somebody is passionate about provisioning on Node. Uh, we want to provide that opportunity. So we've broken out that repo, and we want to give folks uh, an opportunity to develop that and grow that through those community contributions. So let's take a look at some of the things that I just mentioned real quick. And still struggling with technology. <clears throat> so if somebody just let me know when my screen comes through here. Looks like I've got it. Anybody else? Got your screen. Perfect. Good. Great. Thanks. Um, so yeah. a couple things I wanted to show. Um, so these are part of the 2.0 release that's coming. Um, and this sort of goes hand in hand with the provisioning. So as I was porting the code over provisioning to uh, for provisioning, which we'll look at that code in a second, um, I added some support uh, into the, the core library. So for example, for features, we didn't have anything previously for features uh, in the core library. So now you can add and remove features um, and remove, you know, add being activate, remove being deactivate uh, features uh, in the core library. So that's a new capability that's going to be part of 2.0 and it follows uh, the general pattern as, as the rest of uh, the pieces do. The other thing I wanted to mention is I updated navigation. So we've got much more capabilities instead of just being able to get the navigation. You can now add navigation nodes to both the quick launch and the top bar. And you can use this move after method to reorder those nodes. And that operates on them by ID. So, uh, so a lot more capability. Um, you can get to nodes children. And of course, children then is just another nodes collection. So you can add nodes to another nodes children. Obviously, folks are familiar with that kind of a pattern. And we've also now got the ability to update and delete nodes out of the navigation. So we've enhanced uh, the ability to manage that, which is a capability brought uh, over by a need from uh, need in the provisioning library. So I sort of still see these things uh, growing hand in hand and sort of improving a little bit. Um, you know, as a capability is needed in provisioning, maybe that can be added to core. And that's very in line with what happened in the managed code uh, provisioning library. A lot of the core functionality is there in the main library, and then some of the provisioning stuff just calls into that to use that core functionality. So I think that's a good model for us to follow here as well. And one of the other changes, uh, we had a uh, uh, from Mauricio, we had an issue reported where he had a need to add uh, multiple list items to a single list um, sort of uh, rapidly. And if you were familiar with the code, one of the things you have to do when you add an item to the list using REST is you have to have the list item entity type 
name, which is a property of the list. And so we had code that would go out and get that. And uh, what that essentially did, if you were adding, say, 10 or 12 items to the same list, it doubled the number of calls. Um, and then even if you were using batching, it would double up uh, the calls. And so you'd have a call for each item you added, it would go and then again get the list item entity name. So now when you add an item, you can actually pass that in yourself. And the way that looks, I'll just transition over here to the wiki to show you guys um, what that looks like. Here is so you, uh, the list now has a method to get its uh, list item entity name, and then you can actually pass that into each of the add methods. And then we're showing that here will also work with batching. So that can, if you're adding a lot of items, greatly reduce the number of requests going out um, for each of those ads. So again, with an eye to both following the feedback and helping performance where we can, I think that's a good addition. The other thing I wanted to show you is I'm, as part of the 2.0 release, I'm working on a set of articles. This is the first, so obviously I've got a long way to go, and any help is, of course, uh, welcome and appreciated. But so this is working with list items. So this is going to be stepping you through how to add items, how to add multiple items. We'll talk about batching. We'll talk about updating and deleting. And I plan to start uh, trying to get at least one or two articles like this out each week. Um, for the functionality, I'm going to start with, you know, sort of list items, kind of very basic. Um, everybody needs to do that. So I'll start with that and, and kind of branch out from there. So if folks have ideas or want to help out uh, with that kind of documentation, um, certainly welcome that as well. Um, so that's kind of some of the new stuff that uh, is coming in 2.0. And that leads a little bit into provisioning. Um, actually, before we look at the code, let me real quick show you... Um, so this is the new repo. If you haven't been here, it's uh, GitHub SharePoint PNP-JS-Provisioning. And uh, there's nothing in the master branch, so go to the dev branch, and you can see what's here. And so what's here, um, to be very clear, is just a start. This is me taking some time to port over kind of what we had, uh, simplify it a little bit, as well as make it work in Node.js, and then also work with a lot of the same things we had just added for 2.0 into the core library, such as the ability to debug um, and some of the simplified gulp tasks. So that's all in the dev branch. Um, welcome, uh, of course, contributions. This is open um, and ready, and folks can fork this and begin to work with it um, as of today. Uh, so kind of to show you guys a little bit of what's in that code, um, everything is set up. This will look very familiar to you if you've, if you've worked with the JS core before. You've got the debug folder, the gulp tasks. One thing that's new is sample schemas. So my idea is this is a folder that we could add sample schemas in. I've got one here that's uh, the one I've been using for testing. So at, as I was uh, going through and building out uh, the various pieces of functionality, uh, I was sort of updating this schema to just be very simple and uh, for a way for me to test. So, of course, you can have much more complicated schemas. Um, a note on the schema, this does not match at all the, uh, the JSON produced by the PNP uh, managed code provisioning engine. My opinion is that it should, but uh, to be super honest with everybody, I just didn't have time uh, to go through all that as I was sort of porting this over. So that's one thing I think the community could really do is begin to match up those schemas. I don't think it'll be too uh, too complicated, but uh, just wanted to be clear that this doesn't match uh, necessarily the JSON that's getting output from the managed library yet, but I think that would be a great goal. But so this could be a collection of sample schemas. Tests, uh, got no tests, but we put the framework um, there uh, so folks can build out tests. And then the source, so I went ahead and simplified this um, from what we had and kind of cleaned it up a little bit. We still have the concept of handlers, and I won't go through each of these, but it follows the same, uh, what we had in the provisioning code before, where you provision a set of objects against a web. Um, and this, in this case, this is a composed look. Um, but what I've done is refactored each of these to use the code out of the JS core. So we're calling the apply theme method from the JS core. Same for custom actions. Um, and we can look at features. And this is where I was looking at 
uh, we didn't have feature capabilities, so we added that to the core library, and now we can use it here in the provisioning. So kind of a symbiotic relationship between those two libraries. And you can go through these other ones. Again, these are not done, these are not perfect, these are absolutely not complete, but what it is is a start that works, and I wanted to kind of get that over here um, as a starting place for folks that want to evolve this and develop it. Um, so I've got a schema, which is uh, sort of all the various interfaces. Um, folks are familiar with that. And the last uh, thing that really is kind of a big change I made, um, and again, as a starting point, this will absolutely evolve as the community gets involved and, and grows this stuff, uh, is this idea of a web provisioner. So that takes a web, and it takes uh, a hash of these handlers, and it takes a hash of that is the sort for those handlers. So you can actually order the handlers in the, in the way that they're gonna get uh, processed. So I've got some defaults for those. Um, you can actually look at that here in the exports. Um, this of course can all be edited in the future. So again, I'm not trying to say this is the end all be all of things, but it's a start. And to kind of look at how that works, um, I've got a debug file um, setting up the node fetch client. Um, I've got a helper method in here to clean up all the subsites. Uh, as I was testing this, I ended up with a lot of subsites, so this uh, might be helpful to you, and you can, of course, uh, ignore it or, or take it out of here if you'd like. But then, so the example is just a very simple, I'm using the core library to add a web, and then uh, I'm using a provisioner to uh, take that web that's just been created and then applying a template to it. So I'm importing that template just directly here. This template could come from doing a web request using the core library to a SharePoint library. It could come from a uh, no, uh, using some of the file system stuff in Node to read a template. So this template could come from a lot of places. And this apply template then just returns a promise. So you could actually string together multiple apply template calls. Um, instead of having one giant template, you could have several small templates that are a little bit more composable um, and then do multiple chained apply template can you know, calls to that might be an approach. So I'm just going to hit F5, and with any luck, this will run. And what we're going to apply is this very simple uh, template here where we're going to deactivate a feature, um, we're going to set up a custom action, um, we're going to do a web setting, and we're going to set up some navigation, um, and we're going to add and update a couple of lists. Um, so this is fine. These are actually, uh, it's just trying to remove some subwebs that don't exist. That's a bug I haven't chased down yet. Um, but so what we're doing is this sh then should begin provisioning. And while that's working, I'll come back here. And this, I think, is all going to be stuff that's still uh, SharePoint framework related. No questions for me. So No questions. No, Great. no on this one. Yeah. Um, so you can see here it's going through and running the provisioning. I've got the uh, console logger stuff hooked up. So uh, it's going through, beginning provisioning of the web, and then this is it just dumping out the results of that provisioning. So if you look at my example, I've then just, this was, again, just me testing, dumping out this stuff to the console that the things actually happened that I could look at, make sure the values were right. But a little bit more obvious example is if I come here to my dev site, I've now got a provisioning site here. So that's been created. Um, Again, it's just got a GUID name and this, this random stuff in the title. But you can see uh, we've got our uh, navigation nodes here, our navigation nodes up here in the top bar. Uh, we've activated the tree view. Um, we've got our list added. And then if we go look at the documents list, um, and if we look at that document, uh, or that library settings, um, you can see I've updated the description. So very basic start, but I think this is a good start for folks uh, that are interested in provisioning. This can run from Node. Um, did get a great question around, um, are we blocking folks from using this in the browser? And the answer to that is we aren't taking steps to block the use of this out of the browser. It's just not something we would necessarily recommend. Um, we do have the uh, Gulp package um, still exists. I kept that here. So that's going to use Webpack to package up this code. Um, you can see I've got some, some linting errors I need to take a look at. Um, 
but this will package everything up. Right now, I'll tell you, it includes the JavaScript, the uh, the Patterns and Practices JS core library in that web pack. Uh, there's reasons that's good. There's reasons that bad that are that's bad. I'm not going to sort of have that uh, discussion right now. But so this could be deployed uh, and used out of a browser, and it would work just fine. But I do want to stress that's not necessarily, or not necessarily, is not our recommendation. The recommended pattern for provisioning is still, for now, going to be calling out to a microservice, uh, whether that microservice is hosted in Node and uses sort of this JavaScript provisioning, or whether that microservice is hosted in .NET or .NET Core and uses uh, the managed code provisioning model. Um, it could also uh, be something that has PowerShell involved. Lots of options, but the managed code stuff is still uh, way ahead of what we've got on this client-side provisioning stuff. Um, it's much more mature. It's got many more features. Um, so that's still our recommendation. But I'm excited to see what the community can do and how the community wants to grow um, what we've you know, started out here um, in terms of you know, having some kind of node-based or JavaScript-based provisioning. I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, but I do think... Um, you know, it's it's going to come down to uh, really what the community and the energy the community wants to put into growing that. Uh, so coming off that demo, that's a quick preview. Like I said, uh, we're going to try and get 2.0 out uh, Friday or Monday. Um, if I had to guess, I would say Monday. Um, and then I did want to touch on uh, one thing. There was a question earlier that asked, is it a recommendation to use the JavaScript core library in your SharePoint framework projects. And Vase is 100% right. It's not a recommendation. It's not a thing you have to do or even necessarily should do. But our hope in building it is very much the same hope that went into the uh, manage code library that it helps make things easier. So there's of course no requirement to use the manage code library in your in your applications, but doing so makes things very much easier. And our hope is that it will have the same role and folks will choose to use it if it makes sense in their project um, because it makes things easier and it, it takes out uh, a lot of the sort of repetitive work of sort of building up all those REST queries and things like that. So um, do encourage its use, but of course absolutely not um, required. Uh, is it possible to use XML templates like Office PMP Core in the JS provisioning? Um, if somebody wants to build it, it is absolutely possible. Um, right now, uh, no, but uh, it's, it's really, like I said, it's going to now, the provisioning on the JavaScript side, at least for now, um, we could suddenly have a whole lot more uh, folks join the team tomorrow. Maybe that would happen and be amazing, and they might take that up. But for now, it's um, really going to be what the community wants to drive. Um, I think, uh, sort of to echo Bill's point, I think JSON is easier to operate with uh, in a JavaScript environment just because it's JSON and you don't have to parse a bunch of XML. But, uh, of course, if somebody from the community wanted to build XML support into the provisioning library, uh, it's certainly not something we would reject. Uh, I mean, again, uh, we're really looking for that provisioning uh, library to be very much uh, community driven, uh, both on contributions and direction and sort of see where the community wants to take that. Um, like I said, what's there now is just a very early start. Um, you know, something that I wanted to get out there that would at least uh, work, that people could test uh, and start to develop against, but it's gonna really uh, fall on the shoulders of the community uh, at least for now, to grow that. Um, we can get the DDF files back. Uh, we've actually been looking at that. Um, ignoring all this, I've spent a lot of time on getting the DDF files, but not really. Um, any other questions or comments? Is this provision going to step on the toes of the PNP core team? Um, well, so, so let me jump on that team. one. Yes, <laughs> we are part of the core team. Oh. We are the same guys actually doing the CHR implementation. Now, there's a managed engine 
and there's a JavaScript implementation of the engine. The technologies are different, objectives are exactly the same. There are use cases for both engines, and that's what we want to do. If, if people are using Node.js, they cannot use managed C-sharp version of the engine. So we're looking into just uh, reaching uh, to the audience and making sure that the, the, the thinking, the remote provisioning engine thinking is available across technologies. So. But the thing to remember, I think, a lot about the provisioning is there's been at least like a year, maybe a year and a half of solid work by a lot of folks to grow that. And so in terms of maturity, the JavaScript stuff is obviously very much behind um, in both capabilities and features and uh, just usage out in the world and experience. So, um, like I said, our recommendation, my recommendation remains, I know we're not supposed to say recommendation, but would point you towards using the managed code library for provisioning, um, at least for now. But this is another option uh, because we're all about folks having options and working in the way they want to work. Um, there's a lot of interest right now around Node, so uh, it makes sense that if, if folks want to grow a, a Node provisioning library, I think that's fantastic, and I would love to see that happen and would love to help support that. Yeah, I agree. But probably the main workhorse will be the PowerShell approach for the time being, at least, for, for provisioning. Can I ask um, a question about, uh, Patrick, about the 2.0 release of the yes, uh, JS Core Library? Is that going to include that fix for... The promises typings, which uh, run into a bit of a problem when you try to put a uh, use the JS core library inside an SPFX yes. web part. Yes, great question. Um, that was actually the last milestone to, to do the 2.0 release, um, and I had the dependency on waiting for the release candidate zero um, so I could make sure that was fixed, and I can confirm that's fixed and should work uh, just fine with SharePoint Framework. That's absolutely our goal is that you can do NPM install, and it works. Um, no other steps. So if you see any problems, please report it, and we'll jump right on that. But as of 2.0, that should all be fixed. Yeah, the, the, it, it, it worked for me on the dev branch. Uh, will that be find its way into the NPM library, uh, npmjs.com, wherever it is? Yes, the NPM the will be updated. Yep, as soon as we do the 2.0 release, that means, in my mind, the NPM package is part of that release. Like, so that gets updated, um, the master branch gets updated, um, and the Bower package gets updated uh, sort of by default. Um, but so the NPM package will be at 2.0, like I said, likely Monday. Excellent. Thanks, Patrick. Yep. Okay. So we're getting close to the end of the hour. Uh, I thought this was a really great call. I want to thank everybody for their time. Um, appreciate the great discussion um, on all the topics. It's, it's great to hear everybody's feedback and, and see that interest and see uh, you know, folks' minds work about how they want to start using the tools and getting out there um, you know, and, and getting this stuff working. So really exciting stuff. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you for your time. Our next meeting will be February 2nd. Of course, uh, you reach out to us on any of the various social channels. Um, do, if you're interested, please let myself or Vesa know uh, if you're interested in doing a demo. Uh, again, would love to give folks uh, an opportunity to show off their work uh, here to the community. So uh, just let us know, and we can make time for you on the call. So thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend, and talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.